Let's talk about Majin Noah's laying out the Checkpoint Society super quick, because I know cool. we are stuck for time. And I really, really wanted to show you this, because I don't yeah. know if you've seen it, but I really wanted to uh, show you it. So very quickly, let's just get into it. This is Majin Noah's on Joe Rogan's podcast, and this is probably the most important clip of that entire three-hour conversation, but mm. do go and listen to the full thing if you have the time. Let's play this clip. Do you feel like you're sounding the alarm yes. for people that don't understand what the f*** is going on? <laughs> So here, I've pulled it up for you here, yeah? So there's the video. Yeah. I don't know if your camera can see that, but the, no. there's the video. There's him speaking about it. The G7 so is yeah. launching a set of public policy principles for retail central bank digital currencies, yep. CBDCs. Central bank digital currencies could be a digital version of money, a bit like a digital banknote that could be used alongside... Right, so that's the guy who runs currencies. our economy in the UK. His name's the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And here is the article. Nice bank of England tells ministers to intervene on digital currency programming. Yeah, And here's a quote from the article. This is in the Telegraph, the one he pulled up. Okay. But it was behind a paywall, so I'll just read the quote. Digital cash could be programmed to ensure it is only spent on essentials or goods which an employer or government deems to be sensible. Holy now, shit. Now, I'm going to take it one step further for you, Joe, right? So the vaccine passport infrastructure is in place, but now we know that the vaccine doesn't stop infection or transmission, but the Checkpoint Charlie exists everywhere. They bring in digital banking, central banking, digital currencies. You've got a scenario now that you're checking in and out everywhere you go using vouchers that are programmed and you can only spend where you're told you can spend them. There's another word for that, man. That's called the Chinese social credit system. That's what it's called. And anyone who watches Black Mirror will know what I'm talking about. That's that TV show, right? Yeah. So what they are telling us, and when I say they, who's they? People in power. That's the head of our economy, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, second most powerful person other than the Prime Minister and maybe the Foreign Secretary in the UK, right? He's telling us, I just played it there for you. He's telling us that's what he, as the UK, the head of the G7, want to bring in for the G7. So a scenario where like in New York at the moment, because the, the passport infrastructure is in place, you bring in that digital currency and you've got this total control. And if I'm speaking to you the way I'm speaking now and my employer or government, you heard that in the quote directly, yeah, deems me as saying or doing something inappropriate, suddenly I can't actually pay to come here and speak to you anymore. My, my digital currency won't even pay for the ticket because it will be known that I'm coming to speak to you. Sorry, your, your vouchers don't allow you to purchase that ticket to go and speak to Joe. Now, I know that was long, but the reason I definitely want to show that is because what he is pointing out there is exactly one of the major, major issues with the vaccine passport yeah. system. And, well, combining it with the social credit in the form of your bank account being digital and owned by, well, the Fed or the Bank of England is no joke. Yeah. It, it's not him making stuff up. So I thought we'd fact check this lunatic man who has to be kicked off LBC because he's <clears throat> lost his marbles. He's extremist now again. Somehow, no. This is the article from The Telegraph here, and they say in here that uh, Mr. Mudden, the guy from the Bank of England, says that the decision on what going ahead is, that is really delicate debate that needs to be had, and it is not something we can settle ourselves. That is something the government needs to lead on. A digital currency could make payments faster, cheaper, and safer, but also opens up new technological possibilities, including programming, effectively allowing a party in a transaction, such as the state or an employer, to control how the money is spent by the recipient. Mm. That's terrifying. So the Bank of England come out and say, yeah, we are going to make a digital currency. Uh, you're going to have a bank account, and it will be with the Bank of England instead of a third-party bank, because, yeah. well, it's just easier and faster and cheaper and yeah. all the rest, except now that we can also decide whether or not you're allowed to purchase things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or your employer. And what you can spend it on. I mean, that's that's terrifying. I think this is what's, uh, what's driving uh, cryptocurrency growth, because they are basically digital cash. It's, uh, it's spending. It's a, it's, it's a it's finance that can't be traced by the government although it can be in some places they can they can as we saw in, in canada they can restrict um they can close stop you converting it into into normal currency uh, also you can track it as well I yeah, know russian yeah. intelligence services found that out the hard way right so they got caught <laughs> trying to do things and then yeah they got caught by the bitcoin yeah, transactions yeah. there's a steel man version of this so it, let's just say magic is is, is uh, as some of his people or some of the people around him Left us, lost their minds, and said he was extremist. There's a steel man position. What's that one? What's the total just? What's the justification that you could possibly have for saying that the future we should endure is one of a checkpoint society where your bank account is controlled by the states 
and you can be told whether or not you're allowed to purchase things. Well, one potential use could be control over the benefits system, said Sandra Rowe, chief executive for the Global Blockchain Business Council. She compared a programmed digital currency to the US system of paying benefits in vouchers, as it could have a similar goal of restricting the recipient to only buying essentials such as food with the money. Mm. Yeah. Just do the vouchers then. Yeah. We don't have to destroy all of society in the way we have money. Yeah. For you just to go, yeah, we'll just do food vouchers again. Yeah. I think we used to have them in the UK as well. Yeah, I don't know, yeah, I don't know yeah. We still do in some form. It's yeah, just... and they have they have them in America, and yeah, it just seems um, it just seems such a people minor never, upside. People never understand that, like you know, the next government that comes in might not be as uh, as nice and warm and cuddly as this one. Uh, or even our current government, or our current, you know, whatever. what happened to Boris being doesn't, a Nazi, huh? Yeah, it doesn't even have to be the government. It could be we're, we're seeing, you know, in, in Scotland we're seeing people getting, or the, the truckers having their money cut off, and in Scotland we're seeing people getting uh, deposed from jobs uh, for expressing opinions, for expressing scientifically fact, like you can't change your biological Absolutely. sex, which which yeah. is true. You can change your your gender or whatever because it's just a made up nonsense thing. The, the trucker point is right on the money though, because of course it's one thing to say that your bank account in Canada is frozen. You could set up an American one, there are other ways around it. It's horrifying and we should not be living like yeah. this or accepting it as normal in the slightest. But, right, okay, if we're going to fight tyranny, there are ways around it. If the bank account is owned by the state, yeah. there is no way around it. You're you, buggered. You, and you, if it's the only way of there's exchanging, no physical money anymore. exchanging your labor for food, then you can't eat. No, dystopia. Yeah. And uh, the Communism. reason I, I wanted to bring that up, and uh, not only because it's important and everyone should share this video and Majid's clips and his chat with Joe to go and see that because that is terrifying, is there's also one article that came out recently that I, I started digging into for a segment Carl was doing about the effects of lockdown, but very re like quickly I realized there's something much worse going on. So this is a scientific uh, analysis of why the lockdowns failed. So it's just some scientists, some people saying, yeah, okay, we were advising. We showed them why it failed, and here's the reasons. So they say, British scientists and politicians were primed to respond disastrously to COVID-19 long before the virus is even heard of. The author of a book says, um, saying that everyone went mad, and precisely because of their experience with the previously known diseases. First, there was influenza, which on which our pandemic preparation was based. That was why COVID models included schools, which were key drivers of flu transmission, but not care homes, which had disastrous consequences. As Lee did. The second uh, diversion was a specific outbreak of flu, the swine flu epidemic of 2009 to 2010, largely forgotten because it killed fewer than 500 people. Those who do remember it are sure to indicate the parents, sorry, sure to include the parents of around 70 British children who died. Quote, many more children, as Woodhouse 63, a father of one daughter points out, <coughs> than died from the novel coronavirus infection in 2020. Yeah. More died from swine flu than the novel coronavirus. Mm. Some 2019 to 2020 scientists were loathed, quote, to make complete fools of ourselves by crying wolf again. Drastic early interventions, which could have made a difference, like closing the borders, became unthinkable, propelling, uh, propelling policy even further towards the most draconian and, in Woodhouse's view, wrong-headed interventions of all, lockdowns. Lockdowns, Woodhouse say, says, emerged from the idea that COVID could be eradicated, and the idea that COVID could be eradicated emerged from the third misleading encounter with disease, the other coronavirus, SARS. So this is laying out the preparation. Why did they make such stupid decisions on a scientific level with the preparation, specifically with the lockdown? Right. And he says, well, okay, well, we interacted with SARS. We tried to eradicate it. That was the reason that we thought, okay, we'll eradicate it again. Which in 2002, SARS was confined and ultimately crushed by one of the great triumphs of modern medicine. The problem is that there was a crucial difference with SARS. It was almost exclusively transmitted by patients who were obviously sick. Mm. Isolating sy symptomatic cases stopped most of the spread, says Woodhouse. But COVID... I mean, a, there's a bit of a false premise here because uh, lockdown wasn't just to eradicate it or wasn't an attempt to... We sort of knew it couldn't be eradicated, but well, we wanted to reduce, spread the burden on the NHS. Well, this chap worked with the government to come up with the policy. So he's yeah. saying that they were thinking of eradication. Of right, yeah, yeah. At February. Right, then right when it first came out. I'm assuming he is correct in this. Right. We haven't even have his word for it. Yeah. But COVID spreads asymptomatically too, making eradication effectively impossible. Yet convincing those in power to give up the dream of killing off COVID proved impossible. Mm. Even when he laid this out, even when this became transparent, mm. We knew from February 2020, mm. never mind March, that the lockdown would not solve the problem. It would simply delay it, Woolhouse says. A note of enduring disbelief in his voice. And yet in government, quote, there was no attention paid to that rather obvious drawback of the strategy. Mm. So he was in government advising these people. 
as February, February 2020, telling them this won't eradicate the virus, so the strategy doesn't work. No response. Just, mm. no, we don't actually care about that. Okay. Instead, lockdowns, which, quote, only made sense in the context of eradication, became a tool of choice to control COVID. The die was cast in China, which instituted ultra strict measures and unforgivably in Woolhouse's book was praised by the World Health Organization for its bold approach. Mm. The WHO, he suggests, got the biggest calls completely wrong in 2020. The early global response to the pandemic was woefully inadequate. He goes on to say, all this despite a report on lockdowns, wider consequences sent to SAGE by the Office for National Statistics as early as April 2020, assessing how many years of quality life would be lost to lockdowns. The best guess from the Office for National Statistics in April was that suppressing the virus would cost three times more years than the disease itself. Yeah. April 2020, the government knew lockdowns were doing more damage than the virus. But they had, to, they had to play safe or be seen to be playing safe because it's, we've got a nation of bedwetters. Not but, everyone's a cool right wing live or die. Uh, <laughs> well, there's the thing. You have mitigation strategies. We could distribute masks. You could you know, make hand sanitizer available everywhere, make it free so yeah. people use it. You know, all this stuff, there are other kinds of tools. Start being pussies. That's that as well. And uh, these tools were not considered. They were I considered got by coronavirus. The uh, I thought I was going to die. But I was like, well, so what? Okay. Yeah. And then. <laughs> Better good got, life fair. Uh, back to bed. <laughs> when I got Omicron, when I got Omicron, I was like, this is nothing. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a lot more in here I don't have the time for now. But he, uh, he says in here, for example, there's a horrible situation where they were talking about the fact that, well, the virus was racist, sexist, and discriminatory in a good way, in the way that they could actually then target people to be saved from right. the virus instead of just blanket using rules. Yeah, so they yeah. they could target like the elderly. Yeah, for example, the vulnerable. It's, it's the, the vulnerable. Medi the medically fat. And he says, uh, when they proposed this, he was sent a message by his team saying, you should correct your comments. And also it became a mantra that protecting the vulnerable was actually unethical. Unethical. I mean, how on earth do we find ourselves saying that? Yeah. Again, another scientist in the government who decide these things. And this is another example of wokeism uh, actually doing harm. So everybody's like, oh, but woke is just about, it's just about trying not to be racist or trying not to be sexist or whatever. So how can it possibly do harm? Well, it, it can do harm in, in Rotherham when uh, the fear of looking racist allows the worst crimes in humanity uh, to, to happen. And it, it can do harm when, you know, it stops you from targeting uh, the particular groups that are more vulnerable. You can be saved. Yeah, he ends this off with saying about the fact that he thinks that the reason they failed is because they all panicked and uh, there was a groupthink failure on the situation. But looking back at Madges' uh, discussion with Joe Rogan, I'm starting to wonder, because when he mentions that they pointed out in February 2020 and April, these are causing more damage than they can ever possibly save. Also, mm. these were all based on, like, on eradicating the virus and that isn't going to happen. Yeah. They were ignored month after month after month by the government. Yeah. Going all the way to then December, instituting another lockdown. Right. So I think we have confirmation as the reason I bring up the article. If Magic can get a hold of that guy or go over it, give it a read himself, I'm sure he'll enjoy getting confirmation that the government did not care. Mm. It was not about stopping the virus. It was about something else. Yeah. And as Magic claims, it's about control. Yeah. It's about setting up a checkpoint society, which I think definitely has a lot of legs to it. If you enjoyed that section from the podcast The Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to subscribe to get access to all the premium content we have on the site, such as some of the videos we do, this one being the one I did on the mother of all parliaments, the British Parliament being, of course, the origin of a third of the planet's parliaments. But if you'd like to follow me as well, you can also follow on Getter at at Callum on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.